Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is Dharmadi Komo. I'm very happy to have Shin with me today. I'll talk to you about SQL Server running inside uh, Windows Azure Virtual Machines. We're going to focus more on the performance tuning portion today. So, Shin, yeah. why don't you uh, talk about uh, the agenda and then where you're from and all that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dharmadi. Uh, my name is Shin, and I'm a program manager on the SQL Server team. I have been mainly uh, uh, involved in the performance aspect of the uh, running SQL in Windows Azure Virtual Machines. So today, I'll be happy to walk us through uh, some of the key topics in the uh, troubleshooting as well as you know the performance tuning of running SQL in Windows Azure. So without further ado, let's uh, just get started. The key things that we want to cover today mainly includes that you know we want to Make sure that everyone is aware of what are the key considerations in terms of performance when running your SQL in this new environment, basically the Windows Azure Virtual Machines, as well as you know, share with you some of the best practices and lessons learned throughout this whole process you know, before we bring Windows Azure Virtual Machines to GA, as well as you know, this whole past year. And last but not least, of course, you know, because we have very limited access to the uh, machine and also you know, the backend troubleshooting tools, we want to also share some of the key things that you can also uh, arm yourself with uh, in terms of you know, how to actually leverage the whole environment when you're you know, uh, using some of the key things that in here. So um, in terms of the performance, what are the key considerations that typically uh, we want to consider? Yeah, especially uh, with the Windows Azure Virtual Machines, people feel like you know this is not a typical on-prem environment that they're familiar with because they don't actually have access to the hardware anymore. So what would be different is that you know they still you know as usual they need to consider what are the things like you know what is whether this is a problem with my SQL Server application or this is because of the environment that I'm you know not really configuring it the best way and of course when you're doing that it is really worthwhile to put in the effort to first define some of the key performance indicators basically we see two things come into mind one is your throughput and the other of course is your latency or you know when you're putting in the context of your workloads it comes into you know the what's the response time that my user would be able to observe so there are of course multiple dimensions in that aspect as well for instance you would have OLTP workload which is you know typically just 8k in size and it's random reads or writes and also there are of course also data warehousing workloads they are much bigger in size and also mostly sequential and also backup workloads how it is going to behave in this new environment so basically you see things like you know IO size and also whether they are random they are sequential all these bundled up together you need to kind of you know pivot them differently to be able to understand mm. it better I see um, so Windows Azure Virtual Machine has many sizes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have different sizes. What are the sizes that you can talk about and what are the performance implications? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so actually we have this just coming up. The key thing that we need to, you know, as we mentioned, is that you, know, you don't have the exact same environment as you are used to when you're on-prem. For instance, you may have very beefy machine on your uh, you know, on-prem world where you could have you know, a socket or even more. Uh, but in this Windows Azure environment, we have very limited sizes. But of course, you know, we are growing and also increasing the size limit per, uh, you know, for our VM. Uh, but in here, this lists out the currently available sizes that we have uh, in the Windows Azure virtual machines. So basically, it goes from extra small, uh, where the CPU is shared, like half a core, all the way up to A7, where we have eight cores and 56 gig of memory. As you see, you know, this part, it also has a dimension of how many disks that you would have access to. That also is appropriate depending on the VM size that you have. For instance, the A7 has up to 16 disks that you can attach to, and a single disk can be up to one terabyte in size. 
The last column I do want to zoom in here is that it means you know how much IOPS that you you can actually expect. Mm -hmm. So this is already a limit that we are at the Windows Azure is enforcing. It means that it's an upper limit, you know, per disk you would be able to, you know, uh, get to. But you know, it's not a minimum size that it's guaranteed. So this is useful when you're doing your, you know, VM sizing as well as you know provisioning uh, capacity uh, provisioning exercises. Okay, it's very interesting because SQL Server is very I/O heavy and all that stuff. Can we actually peek inside the I/O subsystem that Windows Azure provides? Sure. Um, so when we're talking about the uh, Windows Azure I/O, it's it's important to understand first of all the architecture of it. So uh, different from the uh, on-prem world, where the uh, directly attached disks, you know, you have very low latency because it's local. And here, it's different because it's all network connected storage. And also the backend storage, um, it all, um, okay, we have something in here. So in here, the difference is that in your guest OS, uh, you don't directly access um, your, uh, when you're writing your IO, it doesn't go through the NIC. Actually, it goes through uh, the hypervisor and then share the uh, the host OS network. And also important is that every writes and also every data, a piece of data, is actually triple redundant. It's already built in in the Windows Azure backend storage. So when you're thinking about it, it's always a trade-off uh, between your uh, high availability, uh, the re data redundancy, as well as you know, uh, your data performance. So that also you know, sheds some light into how you would think about the storage. So if we want to look at you know more closely, Windows Azure also offers three different disk types. One is that it has OS disk. It has a fixed size of up to 127 gig. And also it has uh, data disks. And the number of disks, as we mentioned, it depends on what VM size that you have. So in here, uh, it can be you know for extra large VM, you have up to 16 disks. And apart from that, we have a volume D, uh, which we also call the temporary local disk. But different from the two other data disks, uh, other disks that we already talked about, the OS and also the data disk, is that this temporary local disk is not persistent. What it means that is that whenever there is a maintenance or healing event, like you know, if the, the VM crashes, then this disk space basically just goes away. And whatever data that you put on there, you won't be able to see it again. So that's why when we're actually running uh, SQL you know, applications, we would always recommend our customers to stay away, you know, not use the temporary disk for storing any of your data. Got it. Uh, how about caching portion of things, and what's the best practice that you can uh, show us? Yep. So when we're talking about caching, um, we need to be a bit careful because there are multiple caching that comes into mind. And here, uh, specifically, we're talking about the Windows Azure Virtual Machine disk caching. And it is actually a two-tier caching. Of course, as you know, all the caching mechanism, uh, you know, is anticipated. It's to actually, you know, sh kind of shortcut some of the data that you don't have to go to the back end, which is the Windows Azure storage, so that you can leverage the local storage. And here you can leverage two tier. One is your RAM cache, and also the other is your local hard disks. But you have to be aware is that, you know, the RAM cache, of course, it caches your most recently used data. The local hard disk cache, on the other hand, although it's local, meaning that it has lower latency, but it does have a limited uh, IOPS because it is just basically hard disk kind of you know striped over across multiple disks, so it is you know really confined in size in that uh, in that sense. And in terms of uh, disk caching configurations, we do see that you know they vary depending on which disk we're talking about. So that's first, you know, take the temporary disk out of the picture because um, it is not actually implemented as a VHD, so it's, you know, really not applicable for it. 
as to the OS disk and also data disk that we see that the default you know caching mode uh, out of the box you know it's actually different between the two for instance for the OS disk you will see that the default mode is actually read write uh, and also for data disk actually out of the box you will see that you know none basically you don't have the uh, read or uh, write you know caching enabled in that case this basically is because you know for OS we want to gain that you know extra mile in terms of uh, boot performance so that's why it's set in this way so this is basically how it differs between the two and for in terms of best practices uh, we want to make sure that you know for SQL Server we leverage the best of the two worlds. So for instance, for small, really small database workloads, uh, we, we can actually you know, say that you start with your OS disk and run your workload there. Basically, that means you know, very minimal and changes to a workload. So it's simple and also you know, suffice in terms of you know, mostly small workloads. Small, we mean you know, smaller uh, than 10 GB. But on the other hand, if your workload is much bigger, and also it is really intensive in the IO operations, we would of course recommend that you stay away from the OS disk and use data disks instead. So in that case, uh, depending on your workload profile, for instance, if it is really read heavy uh, and you really want high IOPS, and that means you would better off uh, to actually go with, you know, uh, not go with adding caching. Just the default setting would be just great working for you. Uh, so out of the box, disable caching for really IO intensive workload so that you get high IOPS. But on the other hand, if your workload really doesn't really stress that much on the IOPS, but you would want, on the other hand, to get some of the lower latency benefits, you may actually want to test out, you know, just enabling the read caching to be able to see if that gives you some of the extra benefit. Um, for SQL workloads, typically we do write through. So that's why, you know, enabling or disabling the write cache typically doesn't really impact us. So that's the key thing that, you know, I want to make sure that we bring up. Yeah. Um, there's also single or multiple data bits configurations. Mm -hmm. Can you describe more how do we configure those? Yep. Mm -hmm. So as we already see the uh, dimension of that last column when we're describing the VM sizes, we see that you know, per disk level, you're already seeing that 500 IOPS uh, limit is already in effect. So that's why when we're doing the disk configuration and testing as well as you know, for sizing your workload, you would really want to take that into consideration. So for instance, if your workload is lower in terms of IOPS requirements, you can just start with a single data disk, you know, that profile, that works fine. But as your workload grows, you may not see that being sufficient. So that's why you would be able to see that, you know, you really need to actually add more disks to your workload. And in that case, you would also have options. For instance, you know, you can actually do a couple things. One is that you can do just use the database uh, use the file uh, groups to actually distribute your database files across multiple disks evenly and that way you can kind of you know stripe them across that's one option two is that you can also just create a single volume across multiple disks that you have attached so that a lot of times we see people do it because uh, they want to ease the management experience they want to say you know i just want to have a single database uh, a single you know volume to work with that can be you know, a good option for you too, but we have to be careful in here is that you know, even for this option, you can actually do it two ways. One is that you just use the uh, OS volume uh, to just use the Windows uh, you know, OS to actually striping that. The other way is that you can use the, uh, uh, the storage spaces actually. Uh, this is actually based on our testing, um, a recommended approach because we see that the performance difference between using the SQL file, you know, just, you know, file striping and also the storage spaces is very, very trivial. And this is actually giving you the best performance in terms of, you know, uh, using a single volume. Otherwise, um, you are just better off with using the uh, file striping uh, with SQL. So this is, you know, our recommendation. Um, so 
lots of information um, to talk about uh, mm -hmm. doing this thing. You're going to show us the demo today, right? On yep. how to measure performance on the disk. So today I actually just want to uh, showcase a single demo. But even before that, actually, you know, we can actually start and by just taking a look um, at some of the, uh, for instance, in here, I have a SQL I.O. Uh, instance running. So the way that it's set up is that I have a test file. Uh, this test file, we want to make sure that people understand what it does. Uh, basically, this is a random read workload because it denotes that it, it is random. And also, it runs about 300 seconds. And at the same time, um, we have 32 outstanding I.O. Um, and this is 8K in size. So this is a good tool to test the performance of the disk. Yes, this has been the tool that we've been recommending to our customers for years. Mm -hmm. So you have been actually using it already for on-prem, even measuring your performance. Mm -hmm. And in the in this new environment, basically you can still do it. And the way that we also recommend customers do it is that you can actually write it also to an output file. Um, this would actually give you the benefits that uh, when you're doing it, um, you don't. You can actually keep your results. So, for instance, if I want to go to my virtual machine, uh, I can do it. So this brings up all my VMs. And the way you want to do it is that you want to actually monitor your performance on an ongoing basis. And then in this way that you can see that basically I have my VMs created. Um, and you can also see the disk configurations. So it needs to take a little while. And that's just get back first. Uh, to see the results of our, you know, uh, SQL I/O running. So basically, this gives the I/O of over six thousand, and this trans uh, translates into uh, twelve megabytes per second uh, in terms of, you know, throughput. Okay. Over time, actually, you can also plot those results uh, just so that you can have a baseline for your monitoring. And this gives you an indication as to you know when you are seeing your perf trending going up or down, uh, you can get a sense you know where problems can actually arise. Okay, my presentation. So while Shin is trying to get the things up, um, there are many ways to actually uh, get the performance up on the disk perspective. And when we talk about the uh, the disk, right? Uh, you have the caching portion. You also have the uh, the disk configuration portion. Next, actually, Shin is going to show us in terms of the networking. How's the best practice on the networking portion uh, to speed up the disk as well, right? Um, and then also the, um, the, the TEMDB, um, uh, the disk uh, compression in terms of the I.O. also, we can also do that as well. So why don't we switch over to um, uh, my desktop here uh, to start talking about the, uh, the next portion of the best practices. Shin? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next part is about the network performance. Um, so we talk about I/O a lot of you know times, but on the other hand, what we have to be aware of is also that network-wise, it also can be a not bottleneck. Uh, for instance, one concept that Windows Azure introduces is the affinity uh, of affinity group. It basically ensures that you can co-locate your resources so that you can actually shortcut some of the network latency that you don't have to actually you know, come across when you're bundling your cloud service together. So this is an important concept that we recommend to our customers because uh, you would want to actually ensure that you know, shorten your uh, network latency, especially for your chatty network you know, uh, applications when they're bouncing back and forth, uh, you don't actually see that you know, just keep on growing and you know, becomes a, really problem from, a real problem for you. 
And at the same time, you know, within your virtual network, uh, you would want to actually use your virtual IP, uh, internal IP addresses to be able to address each other. And if you really have, for instance, an always on the workload, you can even be a bit more creative. Think of, you know, how to load balance between the av always on availability groups uh, using, for instance, the public IP addresses to just, you know, uh, especially for the read workloads to really, you know, go load balancing between them. Okay, this is cool. Um, so may, let me, there's other things that we can speed it up in terms of the disk on SQL Server as well. Maybe mm -hmm. you can talk about that as well, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So TempDB is already one thing that we mentioned. Uh, so this thing, we really don't recommend our customers going on D drive. Um, so whether the short answer or the known answer, uh, the long answer is no. Uh, you don't want to put your data on TempDB. Uh, why is that, you know, First of all, you would actually go, you know, people would say, I can actually just recreate my folder for my TempDB. Wouldn't that actually work? Well, that can work, but on the other hand, you would still be able to just, you know, you have to actually work across many of the hurdles. On the other hand, if your TempDB, for instance, it can be a bottleneck for you. Uh, in that case, you would really want to partition it out, split them into multiple files. But for that, of course, you wouldn't be able to do with a single disk. So that's why you really want to actually leverage the data disks that you attach, and then you can just split multiple, you know, between the multiple disks uh, to be able to just partition out your TempDB as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, we want to say just to stay away from the D drive, uh, you know, even for your TempDB. Okay. And the other one uh, that is pretty obvious is that, you know, typically you get really good mileage from enabling the data compression. Uh, this becomes even more relevant in the world of Windows Azure Virtual Machines. Why? Uh, it is because, you know, we actually see that reduce a lot of the network traffic and also the IO as well. Uh, so that's why you would really want to enable that option uh, to be able to identify what is the table that you know uh, actually you can leverage the most for this option to enable the data compression. Uh, for instance, we have on in this you know slide we have side by side two type of workloads. Uh, one is the uh, uh, OLTP and the other is like a typical data warehousing query. For both cases, you see that you know the uh, the throughput actually you know just uh, significantly has you know grown. Uh, but on the other hand, we do want to point out that you know your CPU usage may actually grow as well. So just take into consideration of that and make sure that you know it's a balanced option depending on which dimension that you want to get the most of. Uh, you would really you know uh, think about. Uh, the data compression option as well. Okay, um, how about the file initialization? Like, this is also uh, actually one of the lessons learned that we have. Uh, we have seen that you know in the Windows Azure uh, virtual machine environment, anything that is associated with like you know creating a DB, restoring a DB, and also adding files or extending files, those operations can be very very expensive. So. Enabling the instant file initialization is really a key step in here. Uh, you can see the significant difference between with and without them. So really make sure that you use it. And as to how, uh, we actually have a slide you know, in the appendix later that we can share with the user you know, as to how they can step-by-step step configure it correctly. But this is really the key. But make sure that you, uh, you know, this is not something that you cannot really a leverage for your transaction log because basically this is only applicable for your data files. Okay. Um, any other things that we can consider? So um, more lessons we also summarized in our white paper, uh, mm -hmm. the performance white paper. We also have a link later in this slide. Uh, but basically we take into multiple dimensions into account. Like you know we, when we're doing the testing, even the warm up effect we also test it out. Uh, what it means is that we observe that when you have first for, uh, created a virtual machine, attach the disks, and before you actually run your workloads, uh, then measure them and do things like you know you want to benchmark them. You would really want to kind of you know run some test workload, you know, like synthetic workloads to be able to just you know expand the disk a little bit to kind of giving it a warm up effect. 
that usually takes about you know 20 minutes. So that's why when you just directly run your workloads on this vir virtual machine, you may not see your best results just out of the box because it takes a little bit time to actually get to you know a ramp up and to a really stable and also you know good state. And conversely, we also see an effect of you know cooling down. So for instance, if you don't really use your VMs over time. And what we see is that, you know, your performance started to get kind of, you know, getting to a lower state. Mm -hmm. It is because that you, uh, you know, Windows Azure virtual machines, you know, in the back end storage, they have a partition layer, which is kind of a mapping where your actual data is. So if you don't use your data enough, uh, that means that, you know, the pages start to get collapsed together. Mm -hmm. And then you really don't get that fan out, you know, kind of effect to scale out, you know, the, your reads or writes. So <clears throat> that's why over time, um, you want to really make sure that you consider that both the uh, warm up and also the cool, uh, cool down effect as well. Okay. Well, thanks. So you covered the, a lot of the things on performance, mm -hmm. um, a lot of information on the disk portion, the caching portion, the IO portion, and even show us the, the demo of it. Um, so let's say if I already have this running and it's all fine, configured perfectly, um, how about in terms of maintenance, in terms of you know, monitoring and make sure that it's mm. always continues to run well, right? So can yep. you share with us more of that? Absolutely. Mm. Um, so performance monitoring, uh, as we just briefly touched upon, uh, it is important really first to actually establish a, a baseline. So for instance, using the tool as I was showing you, the SQL IO, uh, you can actually choose the different IO sizes uh, for instance, you can have 8K depending on you know what workloads that you're testing out. Use it and also make sure that you write uh, the outputs in a date, uh, in a file, you know, so that you can actually keep monitoring on an ongoing basis. That is an important kind of first step you want to take. And some of the other tools that you want to leverage, uh, you can actually see, you know, for instance, in the Windows Azure Virtual Machine portal, you you also see the dashboard. It gives you a really kind of a crisp and also very high uh, you know, level overview as to you know, what's your resource consumption in terms of you know, especially the, um, the CPU as well as you know, how much I.O. that you're generating. And even further, you can also see, you, know, uh, you can actually enable the storage analytics, which is also a more detailed tool that actually captures every single I.O. that you have issued and what's the experience of that so that when the, uh, the team actually doing the troubleshooting, they can actually grab that file and make sure that you can, they can analyze that as well. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go through more of the monitoring tools perspective. Mm -hmm. I, have used, I see you have screenshots as well. That you can yep. show us. So this is one example, as you know, we mentioned in the dashboard. So it gives you as to you know, how much activity has been going on in the system. The storage analytics, on the other hand, uh, you need to make sure that you enable that in the portal in the configure uh, tab uh, in your, uh, when you actually go into your virtual machine. So this actually just you know, tracks all your blobs and also tables, all the queues, you know, operations. And for instance, it has the server kind of you know, time and also the end-to-end -end time so that they can actually rule out uh, what is you know, the bottleneck of my performance, whether it is actually in the network or it is actually more like you know, in the storage layer. Uh, this is also one key thing that you know, when you're actually escalating you know, through our CSS, our support team will be actually also requiring and asking for this piece of information. And also, absolutely, you know, performance counters, as always, you know, we have been asking our customers to leverage, you know, so that you can see in much more detail as to within your VM, what is the IO, you know, how they are actually responding, what's the response time. You can actually also uh, identify a lot of more uh, bottlenecks through that as well. Okay, um, so you talk about the monitoring portion of mm -hmm. it and how do we monitor making sure that it's okay using the tools that we, uh, we talk about in Azure. Yep. How about if I find out that something is wrong, how do I start troubleshooting? Is there any best practice steps that you can talk about? Sure. Um, so in terms of uh, troubleshooting, uh, we have you know, a lot of the cases where um, in the on-prem world, people are already familiar with, like the steps that you would say, you know, basically it forms into identify the bottlenecks and then just, you know, put forward some of the resolutions. Some of the typical kind of, you know, factors are, you know, like, you know, the, if you have K 
cat, uh, the plan change, and also if you have uh, you know just bottleneck on your hardware that you identify. For instance, your I/O subsystem is just not keeping up. You know, typically those aspects. You know, uh, we have very exhaustive guidance for customers for on-prem as well already. Uh, but what we want to take, you know, if we move to the next one, uh, we can see that you know in this new world. One key thing also still there is that uh, you would want to incorporate the definition of your KPIs uh, into this step, uh, especially when we're dealing with you know Windows Azure Virtual Machine, and especially when we don't have direct access to the host machine to a lot of the you know key performance indicators there or you know counters either. Um, so for instance, if we go further, uh, we would see some of the examples. Uh, that we can actually guide our customers to see uh, what are the typical indicators of issues and what are some of the resolution or mitigations that you can take. Uh, be mindful, of course, that this environment uh, you have limited access or uh, limited, you know, resolutions, you know, or kind of, you know, what you can weapons, you know, in your in your, you know, that you can actually have. Uh, for instance, if you really see that CPU being a bottleneck, and after all the typical troubleshooting and you know uh, the things that you can do, uh, an option maybe just you have to scale up, meaning that you have to go for a larger VM size. Mm -hmm. And if you actually identify you know some of the other issues in your I/O subsystem, well, this is the part that you know you really don't have any other kind of scale up option, not just yet, but you know, in future we actually have enhancements. In terms of you know we have much lower response time uh, and latency I/O subsystem coming along, uh, but you know uh, all the resolutions you would have to really see what you can do with the current you know situation. Right. Yep. Um, so, can you do a quick summary on what we talk about and what's the yep. additional resources that they have? Sure. So uh, basically, we in the session today uh, we actually walked us you know basically through. The same structure as we actually outlined in the performance white paper. This is something that we have published, you know, last June. We highly recommend our customers to go and check it out, especially when we're talking about those lessons learned and best practices. They're exhaustively, you know, just being summarized in this white paper. And even some of the tools and examples, like you know, the SQL I/O. How do you use that, and how do you actually kind of you know leverage that for your ongoing performance monitoring? Uh, they all, you know, have been given examples and summarized in the appendix. So that is important. Uh, the second thing is that uh, remember that Windows Azure Virtual Machine it is a cloud environment. So inherently, you would see performance difference as well as you know the variability. So that is why it is really, really critical for you to have the necessary tooling to be able to monitor and also to be able to identify. The key bottlenecks of your performance. Mm -hmm. uh, just you know, making sure that you have that kind of baselining is already important. Um, the other thing, uh, of course, you know, you would have different VM sizes to choose from, and also the difference in terms of the I/O subsystem. Uh, but all those comes into you know what this new environment is about. Uh, follow your traditional steps that you have already known, uh, you're familiar with. Basically, you know, largely uh, they all still apply. Uh, but some of them are even more important in this new environment uh, than in the traditional on-prem, especially like you know, instant file initialization, and as well as you know, using the uh, page compression for your, some of the key you know hot uh, tables in your system. Those become even more critical uh, for this new environment. Mm -hmm. So those are the key things uh, that we want to make sure you know uh, comes across in this session. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Shin. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm just going to uh, show you guys the white paper itself. Um, so we're going to continue um, this uh, conversation today. We'll take a break, uh, about 15 minutes, and we'll be able to come back and show you guys about uh, data warehousing as well as the business intelligence workload. How is it running inside SQL uh, a Virtual Machine as well in Windows Azure? Okay, thank you so much guys for uh, watching. Thank you.